I'm Frances Wood um, and for a very long time, for 30 years or so, I was head of the Chinese collections in the British Library. And then in my spare time, um, I used to amuse myself by writing books about China um, to try and introduce Chinese culture to people in the UK and Europe. I am Dave Critchley. I'm the executive head chef at Luban Restaurant here in Liverpool. So our vision here is to train the next generation of Chinese chefs. We're also teaching the rest of our staff about Chinese culture so they can take that information and pass it on to our customers and our guests. My name is James Trapp. My Chinese name, if you want it, is Pu Huajie. And I'm currently a freelance translator, uh, principally of contemporary Chinese fiction although I have translated some of the classics in the past. So many of the extraordinary things and the good things that are going on in China, in, in contemporary China, um, are, are not even known about in the West. I'm Michael Wood, I'm a filmmaker, a broadcaster, and uh, do academic work as well in journalism. I love Chinese civilization, if I can put it that way. Just the, the way they do things, the sense of humor, the food, the sociableness. Um, I feel comfortable um, being in China. Well, joining me on the stage, uh, the people you saw in that short film there, this is a historian and filmmaker, Michael Wood. We have Francis Wood, who is the former head of China Collections at the British Library. Next to her is translator James Trapp. And then we have Dave J. Critchley, who's executive head chef at Liverpool's Luban restaurant. Uh, welcome. It's lovely to have you all with us. Um, so the theme of this panel and very much the afternoon, but this panel in particular is bridge builders, uh, building bridges between China and the UK, something you've all done in, in very different ways. And I, and I want to start with you first, Michael, if I may. Um, you've made documentaries on all kinds of things, uh, places from the Amazon uh, to Alexander the Great, to Saddam Hussein, but you've, you've had a very special relationship um, with China and become known for your expertise on it and your love of it. I wonder, the first time you went, did it meet your expectations? Was it what you expected? Well, I first went in the, in the early 80s, just after the reform and opening up had started. So it was a very different China then. I mean, my expectations, I suppose, I mean, I fell in love with the sensibility when I was at school with uh, Chinese poetry. And then when I was at university, I shared a house with a German sinologist and all kinds of wonderful characters would come through our kitchen, like David Hawkes, who was, who was translating the, the dream of the Red Chamber and all that. So I, I kind of, I loved all that. Um, but my knowledge of China was really the Chinese culture rather than civilization, rather than anything else. So I think I went pretty open-minded and I, I just loved the, you know, the, the, the British sinologist Herbert Giles in the 19th century said, talking about other translators of China, he'd lived in China for 20 or 30 years. So he had a very, he said, the thing to remember is the Chinese people are very open-minded, clear-headed and optimistic people. And he said, and, and if you don't know China, you won't get that. And that's the way he started out thinking about the poetry. And I think that's, uh, that's the same for me, really. I would add fun to the, to the mix. But yeah, that's what I, I loved when I went there, and I still do. And Francis, you came to know China through your love of language and later on uh, through books, particularly the old texts that you, you helped restore and look after. How important is the concept of history to China, would you say? And how, through knowing uh, China's history, can we know the country? I think, I think people in China have a slightly different attitude to history. Um, and I, I feel it, often feel it's kind of slightly more elastic than ours, that it stretches further back. I'll never forget talking to a very elderly Buddhist monk on the, the Buddhist holy mountain of Jiuhashan in Anhui, middle of nowhere. And he said, England, England. Don't you have a queen? She must be extremely old. And I'm sure he was thinking of Queen Victoria and he just sort of <laughs> stretched history. And I think there's a kind of sense for a lot of people in China that, you know, what was in the past is still with us rather more than, than we have. Um, and so I think it, it's, it's terribly important to try and understand China's past and see how it fits into the present and to appreciate it. I mean, China's history is the history of a people 
my, as Michael says, you know, an extraordinary people, resourceful people, um, people of all sorts. But it's, you know, the other side of the world and their solutions to things are just endlessly fascinating. And when it comes to language, uh, James, you're also uh, very much involved in Chinese language, speaking it fluently, translating it, books of all kinds. Well, <laughs> I'm sure it's better than mine. <laughs> translating all books, all kinds of books um, from Chinese into English, including fiction. Uh, and I wonder how you think translating fiction and reading fiction from other countries uh, helps people getting to know a different culture. Well, um, self-evidently, I suppose, the, the fiction of any, of any given um, culture reflects that culture. Um, and most interestingly, as with everything in China, it's, it's the way things are the same and they're different. Um, that what's forgotten is that we are, we're all humans and we all have human reactions and human emotions, but we will see things differently. Um, and I think it's particularly in... in um, fiction and contemporary fiction, that that comes across. Um, also in the language, I mean, it, it all works together, um, language, culture, um, literature, and so on. But if you're working with Chinese language and translating, um, it's very different from um, working with their Western language in that you're not, you cannot make a, a literal translation. I mean, I sit there and I, I look at this chunk of, of characters and then at the translation I've made underneath, and I think, how on earth did I manage that? <laughs> I mean, because they look so, they, you know, but what they're doing, they're doing exactly the same thing in different ways. And I think that's, that's the whole point um, about, um, about engaging with, with, with another um, culture, especially through its literature. Um, the concerns, you'll recognize all the concerns in a Chinese novel, um, but they'll just be that little bit different. They'll, they'll um, open new, um, vistas on interpreting emotions or interpreting indeed history or whatever. Um, and it adds, it just simply adds not just to your understanding of that country, but to your understanding of yourself and, and of humanity as a whole, which sounds like a horribly um, sweeping thing to say, um, the kind of thing I would normally avoid saying. But in this case, I think it's true. Um, can I just add, though, I'm terribly pleased to be here at this moment because I suddenly realized that almost exactly 50 years ago, just across the road from here at the Royal Academy was where my interest in China began. Oh. There was an exhibition called The Genius of China, which I went to when I was 13. And that sparked the whole thing. So it's really nice to be here. Well, when I was looking into your stories and sort of reminding myself of them, it's, it's remarkable how there was a moment where uh, you picked up a poetry book and that started your love of China. You went to an art exhibition and started your love of China. And, and, and Dave, it was food for you, perhaps not surprisingly as an executive chef, but um, it was food that began your, 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 let's, you know, your strong relationship with China. Um, so when you went, um, how was it? What did you learn? Uh, and what can we all learn uh, uh, from, uh, you know, getting to know a country through its food? Uh, I mean, wow, where do I start with that question? Um, <laughs> Sorry, it was three one, really, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so Liverpool has deep, it's got, it's a lot of history and culture with China. Uh, but until I actually got out of China proper, I didn't understand it. I had everything I thought I knew about China forget it. Um, I'd only ever seen museums, uh, I'd seen local Chinese community, customs, stuff I was interested in as a boy and growing up in Liverpool. I mean, Chinese food is our staple food actually in Liverpool, if you've ever been, it's quite crazy. Um, and that's due to the fact that China's settlers arrived at Liverpool first in the UK and in Europe, I think. So we are the oldest Chinese community in the Western world. And you, you, you can feel that and you can see that. And it is part of our everyday life. And I think that's just a beautiful thing as a scouser. Uh, but getting to China was just fantastic. And I'm, I'm at the beginning of my Chinese journey. This is only four years in the making now, but what a journey it's been on. My life has literally changed instantly. Everything I thought I knew about China just went, went out the window. And I've began this whole new, uh, it's, it's a whole new life, a new cycle of life almost um, with Chinese food and trying to marry the food and the culture to what I'm doing and what I'm teaching the next generation of chefs being over me. That's now my role, that's now my job. Um, it's just been phenomenal. So the people amazingly hospitable to me, um, which was 
really cool because I kind of went on my own and was quite scary. 20 hours travel, get there. I'm like, what am I going to walk into? I have no idea. And I got, to, I got me to feel really special, really welcome, uh, an esteemed guest. And that's what hospitality is all about. Everyone should walk into my restaurant and feel that same way, feel like a king, feel, but also feel so comfortable there as well. This is my surrounding, I, I belong here, everyone's so nice. And so the people was the first um, interactions I had, obviously, and they were amazing people. Um, and then the food, I mean, what can you say about the food? It's, it's phenomenal. And there's so many different styles. I, I'm focused um, on Tianjin food. This is a style of food that people in Liverpool and probably the rest of the UK haven't seen before. Um, so that's the food I'm bringing to the table. I must say there was a lot of pushback initially. This isn't Chinese food. This is not what we're used to. Um, but we're, we're growing on people and we're teaching them and we're educating and we're trying to bring, bring as much culture to the table as well. Uh, and it's just been absolutely phenomenal. I mean, the cities themselves, Tianjin was just mind blowing for me. I come from a relatively small city in Liverpool. And when you get out there, you're just like, wow, this is, a, this is a proper city. I come to London and I think this is pretty big or Manchester. But when you get to Tianjin and the bigger cities, I've not yet been to, but I have seen mind blowing. So um, again, but what was evident was um, the similarities between Tianjin and Liverpool are actually astounding when you kind of step back. You've got this amazing port city with its history, with its culture. The trade for the country was coming through the ports in both of these cities over the years. Um, I, and I just like to think, I think it's because we live by the water, but the, the sense of humor there is phenomenal. And it's very apparent that we, we got on straight away. A lot of Mickey taking, a lot of fun, a lot of excitement. I think, Michael, you picked up on that. The fun element should never be forgotten about it was it was incredible and um yeah it has been life-changing for me yeah that really comes across you're very passionate about it aren't you uh michael i wonder if we can talk about uh, your documentaries uh, you, you, the story of china huge success in china and the uk also uh the documentary about Fu, the chinese poet why do you think they struck a chord in china itself um well i hope i hope they struck a chord on one level because they were you know good films they had their weaknesses but essentially good films that put over a story with empathy and um, you know I think judging by the response from the Chinese audience and we got a lot of response from the Chinese audience um, I think they felt that Chinese people these days are so used to rather slightly hostile or cold reception uh, uh, or or um or films that really are either about mass development and population or environmental problems, or, but something that, that took you into what Chinese civilization, a kind of potted guide to what Chinese civilization had been, um, that was empathetic. I think that was the key thing. And a lot of Chinese people said that, that they thought that was, that was great from a foreign Filmmakers, you know, and actually the fun thing, I, to I totally agree. I mean, we actually had, we actually had online comments about the films going, see, they're showing what we're really like, that we're fun, you know. Um, so I think, I think that that was one aspect of it, just as films. But another is that Chinese people are really proud of their history, aren't they? You know, and they're really knowledgeable about their history. Uh, with the poets, for example, you can quote a Chinese poet about politics from a thousand years ago, and everybody knows what you really mean. You know, uh, they, they live and breathe the poetry. So when it came to the, the film about Du Fu, I was amazed by the response in China, you know, that, that uh, we had interviewed by everybody about it. You know, even the Central Committee for Discipline of the Communist Party kind of unbelievably ran an editorial on the Monday morning after the film went out saying, why, we've got to look at Dufu and, you know, why have we failed to do this? You know, and my friends in Beijing were all texting me going, you can't believe this, you know. So I think, I think they felt that, um, you know, instead of just being outsiders who had gone in and sort of plundered Chinese history, in a sense, we were letting the Chinese people themselves tell the story, and often ordinary people, you know, like your Buddhist monk, you know, you kind of, the Chinese people are great with 
TV. You kind of you're in the back streets of Kaifeng, and there's a guy on a charpoy in his string vest reading the paper. He's about to just go off and have a game of cards, and you say, "Do you know the legend about?" the two babies and the founding of the Song Dynasty. Oh, well, he stands up and he's acting it in no time at all. The, the legend from a thousand years ago. So that love really became apparent. And the further we went making the film, the more you thought, you've got to bring the Chinese people into this story. And, and we did, you know, uh, families descended from the leaders of the Taiping Rebellion, the giant rebellion of the 19th century. You know, people who participated in in, in, in great events often. Um, the films we did about Deng Xiaoping's opening up, we interviewed people who'd been working in the fields in, and, or doing hard labor in, or working in machine tool shops in 1978 and who became movers and shakers in Chinese society. They talked about how, um, you know, how life transforming the decision was to um, uh, start the university exams again. We even interviewed the peasants in Shaogang in, in Anhui who had broken with the communist system at risk of their lives in 1978. So as filmmaking developed over those years, the more we relied on the Chinese people themselves, I think. Mm. So I suppose uh, uh, film and television is a, is a, a language that everyone can understand. Um, and and uh, Francis and James, you both speak Chinese. How how much has that made it easier for you to understand the Chinese culture? Obviously, uh, it, it's, uh, it does make it easier, but um, how much of a barrier is there for people who don't, do you think, Francis? Hmm, I, well, it's one of, I, I have a big thing about, I think people are terribly afraid, in, in this country, they're terribly afraid of Chinese. They all say, oh, it's terribly difficult, impossible, and so on. And I really want people to try a bit harder because actually the thing about Chinese, it's mostly hard work. It's not that difficult, but you do have to learn your characters. But um, I think what people don't realize is that the Chinese, because of the character system, you can develop a vocabulary in your own area of specialization. I mean, if you're a, someone who studies geriatric medicine, it's not that difficult to learn enough Chinese to be able to learn what the Chinese are set writing about geriatric medicine. You get that vocabulary. And I'd really like to encourage people to take a specialized vocabulary you know, and not feel afraid. I used to teach people who are interested in ceramic history and reading about kiln sites and how Chinese ceramics developed. And they very quickly got to the point they could read a kiln site report, no problem. Um, so people are too afraid of Chinese, I think. And of course, China is one of the places that, I mean, people have been talking about how nice people are. China is one of the places, unlike France, I should be careful about that, but one of the places where if you speak sort of three words, people are lovely to you, you know, and you have these wonderful conversations with people in the middle of nowhere. You don't have to speak much, but, you know, people are so happy and so impressed that you've made the effort that they really, you know, welcome you in. So I think trying to speak the language is important. And you don't need to speak it well. People are extremely kind of elastic. I mean, I've had wonderful people in the countryside and, you know, in the north of China saying, oh, your Chinese is so much better than ours. You've got, you know, <laughs> peaking, <laughs> at peaking pronunciation, whereas we are not, you know, and you think, gosh, no, they're completely wrong. But they're very kind, they're polite, and they're happy. You know, so language is a, it's a good way in, and many more people could have it. And James, do you agree? Is that has it allowed you to get to know people on a on an extra level? Let's say. Um, absolutely, yes. And and I mean, also you have some quite hilarious moments when, particularly the Chinese, don't expect Westerners to be able to speak Chinese, uh, and and they will look at you in blank incomprehension initially uh, um, when you speak, which then makes you think your Chinese is awful. But in fact, it's not. They're just not ready for it. They're not programmed for it. Or they think that their English has suddenly improved dramatically. Um, <laughs> but it's, I mean, now is not the time for a, a diatribe about the failings of the English, British education system in terms of foreign languages. But I was involved with that, and I, I was involved with trying to promote primary school Mandarin. Um, and there's a, there's a point somewhere. There are two barriers. One is that you mentioned China and a whole... Um, wall of incomprehension and, and misunderstanding comes down and blocks off um, about China and, and, and Chinese culture. And the other is about the language. Oh, it's impossible. You can't do it. And it's not. There are some very successful nursery schools um, and, and um, key stage one primary schools teaching Mandarin really successfully because, as I said earlier, it's just another way of communicating. Um, and 
kids, thankfully, don't ask stupid questions that, that teenagers and adults do. Why do they do that? Why is it like that? They just accept it. Um, and you need to look at it in, in, in that way. It's just another way of communicating. And it, it's not a difficult language. It presents um, different ways of doing things, but often they're simpler. I mean, everyone complains about cases, tenses, singulars, plurals, masculines, feminines in, in Western languages and in classical languages. You don't have any of them. Um, no, and it, in, it encourages a different way of thinking. It encourages conceptual thinking. This is, you notice this when you're translating. You're not translating a sentence. You're translating a series of ideas and finding how they're connected. Um, there's evidence that um, actually, if you look at Chinese paintings, it's the same, um, that it's the gaps which Westerners like to fill in. We want, we want, if you look at a Western landscape painting, it's covered. Every square inch is covered. So the artist is telling you in precise detail what he wants you to see. Look at a Chinese, classical Chinese landscape, there are great areas of blank silk or, or paper, which you, the artist gives you cues to interpret. So you're not looking at blank, you're looking at clouds, you're looking at mist coming up from a waterfall, you're looking at a river disappearing into the background, because the, the artist has given you the context in which to interpret it. And the Chinese language works to an extent in the same way. Westerners and Chinese apparently look at things differently. There's an experiment when, um, sorry, I'm going off, but I think it's fascinating, but never mind. It's fascinating. Um, <laughs> okay. um, the, um, a group of Chinese students and a group of American students were shown exactly the same photograph. And I think it was actually a, a pilot in a fighter jet with other jets in the background. Um, and the, the people doing the experiment um, measured the eye movements of the two different groups. And whereas the Western student, the American student, zeroed in immediately on what they thought was the focus um, of the picture and then worked out from that, Chinese students scanned the whole picture to gain the context and then narrowed in on what one might be the, um, what might be the sub, what might be the focal point. Um, and so it's a different way of seeing things. And if, when, if you're learning Chinese, if you're translating Chinese or whatever, you're actually, you're reprogramming your brain to an extent. You're learning new thinking skills. Um, mm. And that's, that's the huge benefit of it. And that's, that's the joy of it in many ways, because it, you suddenly see different ways of communicating. I think I probably now write English differently from the way I used to because of all the time I've spent reading Chinese. And hopefully, I mean, that's a good thing. Um, <laughs> so, you know, it, it, it's huge benefits. And literature, mm. we said earlier, is where, where you will you find the meeting point of all these things. And one, one language that uh, we all perhaps share is the commonality of food. We don't have any more time to talk about it, which is a shame because I could talk about food all day, but it really does uh, cross all cultures, doesn't it? Everyone can get together around the dinner table and, uh, and uh, you know, uh, find something in common there. Uh, so, uh, yeah, looking forward to uh, perhaps coming to Liverpool and tasting your food, just inviting myself. Oh, I hope that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, thank you very much indeed for uh, speaking to us today. We have historian and filmmaker Michael Wood, Francis Wood, former head of China Collections at the British Library, translator James Trapp, and Dave J. Critchley, who's Good executive much. head chef at Liverpool's Luban restaurant. Great to talk to you today. Thank, Thank you for joining you. us. Thank you.